Hi, this is Bob Brown with DeLong Rigging Solutions. Industrial hoists are commonly called chain motors in the entertainment industry and are used for most arena rigging. Rigging in spaces without a counterweight system like hotel ballrooms or athletic facilities. In theaters, when touring shows opt to use them for lighting trusses. Audio and automation, as well as in places where the counterweight system isn't robust enough for some specific task. We mostly use one-ton or half-ton models, but two-ton and quarter-ton hoists are also often used. Selecting the right size chain motor for each rigging point is the responsibility of the show's head rigger and the equipment vendor for a production. If at any time you are not confident that what you are being asked to do is within safe parameters, consult with your venue management chain of command. If your concerns are deemed accurate and of sufficient concern, consultation with the venue's structural engineer and rigging staff can be initiated. In most cases, production staff, venue technical staff, and in the event promoter will have already discussed and consulted the venue engineer as it may be appropriate. Still, if something appears to be inaccurate or improper, best to share that info up the food chain. When used, in an industrial application such as a warehouse or manufacturing facility, the motor portion is usually painted orange or yellow and hung at the ceiling with the chain coming down. But in entertainment, the motor housing is typically painted black and we hang them in the opposite orientation, with the motor staying closer to the ground and the chain going up, as that requires the upriggers to pull less weight, which is safer. If someone in entertainment says a motor is inverted, that means it is being used in the industrial orientation with the motor up. That may be necessary to meet height restrictions or for aesthetic reasons and may require additional upriggers staffing for safe installation. Most chain motors look a lot alike and work similarly. There will be a hook on one side of the motor and a chain with another hook that runs through the other. Only one thing should attach to each hook. If you need to attach more than one item, for instance, two slings and a horizontal lifeline to suspend a truss section. Use a pair ring, oval ring, or suitably sized shackle. Excess chain stores loosely in a bag, which is hung point of the hook facing out on the side of the motor. You'll want to ensure the chain can feed in or out freely so you don't have a big bunch of chain unexpectedly fall. Feed it into the bag hand over hand and know that it should be oily, so it is a good idea to wear gloves. As you are doing this, check for rust, excessive dirt, and other signs of excessive wear, and notify the lead rigger immediately if you find a problem. Although there are battery-powered chain motors now available, hardwired is still far more common. The power cord might be a seven-pin mini Sakapex connector or a twist lock plugged into an electrical cable run to each motor's position. Both have an indexed connection, so line up the key with the keyhole. Push tight and turn the ring or connectors clockwise until snug to connect. Then connect the motor cable dog clip to the motor housing as a strain relief. Different vendors have a different methodology for this strain relief, but all chain hoists should have some means of accomplishing the task. Always look at the electrical cable for any damage, such as cut insulation, or loose connectors and remove those cables from service. Though IATSE has departmental lines with rigging and electricians in separate departments, we help each other by double checking to ensure safety. Some IA locals will have the electricians make the electrical connections. Some have the riggers do it. In others, either department can do it. So we all need to know how to do it safely and keep an eye out for each other. The controller you use to operate the motor will depend on the kind of hoist, how many you need to move at once, and where it is located. For moving small distances where the motor is within reach of the ground, a pickle controller is the best option as it provides immediate control right where the action is happening. This is primarily true for hoists which have contactors within the motor case such as a CM chain hoist. For direct drive hoists, the contactors are physically located in the hoist power distribution rack instead of within the hoist body. Pickle power for direct drive hoists typically require dragging around a task-specific power cable 
with an up-down switch instead of having a dedicated control plug available on the hoist. In many situations, a downrigger will use a pickle to float the motor into position when it is initially hung. A motor control pickle typically has a two-position rocker switch or two buttons, which make it easier to use one-handed. Let those nearby you know that something is about to move by calling out clearly, motor moving. Pause to give the others a chance to respond. Double check the motor's path of travel is clear. Do a bump check to ensure the motor is moving in the direction you want by pressing the rocker or button for down and immediately stopping it by letting the rocker switch come back to neutral or taking your thumb off the button, depending on which type of controller you have. You should use the down button first in case the power is out of phase. Most hoists used in touring productions are three-phase motors and the power distribution has the option to swap the phase in order to achieve the travel in the correct direction. If you are on the first hoist of the day and the phase orientation has not yet been checked or someone has inadvertently hit the phase swap button, hitting the down button first allows you to correct the issue without damaging the limit switches in the hoist. Once you have confirmed the path is safe and everything is in working order, traveling in the correct direction, give another verbal warning. Downstage left motor going out, pause to confirm the pathway is still clear, and push the button to move the hoist into the targeted position, helping keep an eye on the pathway, attached power cables, slings, etc., and be ready to stop if needed. It is also good practice to run each hoist in both directions, up and down, as it comes out of the travel case and floats in preparation for its assigned task. If you have a controller or cabling problem that prevents the motor from coming back down, best to find out during the load-in instead of in the midst of a load-out. Depending on how much chain is in the air versus how much chain left in the road case, you may need to run a fair amount of chain through the hoist before it will float. Care should be taken to make sure the chain is running cleanly through the hoist with no knots or twists in the chain. If there appears to be an issue with the chain being badly twisted, then sometimes best to pull the chain out of the case and stretch it a few feet across the floor outside the case. This allows gravity and friction to help stretch it out and untwist it as well as give you a good view and opportunity to fix any remaining issues before they hit the chain guides of the hoist body. Similarly, on a loadout, the chain should be run through the hoist. Some hoists have lower limits, but many direct drive hoists just have a stop block on the chain. Hoists with lower limit switches should run all the way to the limit and then be reversed for a few seconds. Hoists with stop blocks on the chain should be run out until they only have a loop of chain about one foot long. It is also important that the stop block is still hanging on the side of the hoist body. If the stop block is run so far as to be on the top of the side of the motor body, the lid to the hoist road case may not close properly. We often need to move groups of motors that support the same piece at the same time, say for a larger piece of scenery, LED wall, or complex multi-section lighting truss. To do that, we use a handheld remote like this one from our friends at Motion Labs, which can control up to eight motors at a time. Controllers are available in numerous configurations for various numbers of hoists per controller, as may be required for a specific production. On this type of pendant, each motor has an individual three position toggle switch. If you flip it up, a green LED will illuminate. Down lights a yellow LED, and in the middle position keeps it static. The red kill button cuts power to the motors, so it needs to be disengaged for the motors to work. To use this, make certain you can clearly see each hoist you want to move. Check each individually first, loudly announcing, trust motors moving, then doing a quick bump check of each individual motor to ensure they have power and move as expected. Once you have confirmed that, Move the toggles up or down for all the motors you want to move simultaneously. Give a loud verbal warning. Downstage truss going out. Then press and hold the go button to have the hoist move in the indicated direction, keeping an eye on it as it moves into position. 
It is important to have a spotter opposite from your viewpoint, also looking at the piece as it is moving. It is also important to make sure that nothing else is inadvertently moving with the same unit for which you intend to move. For instance, one motor of the stage left audio may be moving by itself when you intend to move and are watching the stage right audio. Best practice is to segregate motor controllers by department and by physical location. That way, if one of the directional LED indicators is malfunctioning, or the bright sunlight makes them difficult to see, or one of the toggle switches is broken, etc., any rogue hoist move is nearby the operator and more likely to be detected quickly. Once an object is in position at its playing trim, the power and control cables may be disconnected or dressed neatly out of the way. As a general rule, any hoists that are not required to move during a performance should have the breakers killed at the motor control distro once they are on the trim. Kill switches and e-stops are an important feature of the system, but as long as the breakers are physically accessible, they should be killed also. There are a few caveats to consider regarding the procedure just indicated. For instance, LED walls and some complex truss structures do not react well with the bumping of individual hoists. The inherent rigidity of the structure may transfer large quantities of load weight with minimal changes such as a bump check. Because a situation such as this is complicated and subject to many factors, the tour rigger may have a different procedure. If there is any doubt, the tour rigger should be consulted and they in turn will likely consult with a vendor who owns any respective piece of equipment. Please remember that DeLong Rigging Solutions one-shot training videos are meant as general information. Every system is different, every venue has different procedures, and even the same show in different places has different needs. All statements made make certain assumptions about systems and venue similarities. Nothing can replace on-site training with a qualified individual. If you have a question or concern about rigging, do not hesitate to reach out to us or another qualified vendor in your area.